All right, lessons from King Solomon. Lessons from King Solomon. You know, we have a lot of life examples from stories in the Old Testament. Um, Job's example, you know, helps us to endure hardship and suffering. You know, people are going through hard times. We can look to Job on how to endure that hardship and suffering. David's example helps us to submit to ungodly authority or unideal authority. You know, he was um, servant to uh, King Saul even after he was um, ordained as king. And we see how he behaved himself wisely in his house. Daniel, his example helps us to stand up for what is right. You know, we talked about that when I preached on Dare to Be a Daniel. When he took a stand against tyranny against what, and stood up for what was right in God's eyes. Samson's example. What about that? We see some good examples in the Bible. We also see bad examples. Samson's example teaches us the dangers of ungodly company. You know, whether it's friends, bad friends, or whether it's, um, you know, people, people of the opposite gender. But Solomon's example in the Bible teaches us the vanity of the pleasures of this life. And I think Solomon's example, you know, I mean, all of these can be relevant to us, but I think in a prosperous country like Australia, where we have uh, many comforts and many uh, riches, you know, we, we may not be as rich as, you know, um, the, the extremely rich, but I'd say compared to most of the people in the world, we are extremely prosperous people. And, uh, you know, we're not wondering where our next meal is coming from. We have plenty of changes of clothes. Our house, our houses are filled with junk. And, uh, you know, we have, you know, probably uh, weeks of food on hand uh, that could keep us going. Uh, we're not looking for our next meal. So I think Solomon's example is good to reflect on every now and then to teach us the vanity of the pleasures of this life. Uh, because we have King Solomon. Example. So who was he? King Solomon. I mean, he's a very famous character in the Bible, but a few facts about King Solomon from God's word. Number one is he's the third king of Israel. He's the second son, son of King David and Bathsheba. So he wasn't the first son because you remember when Bathsheba had conceived, um, David's punishment was to lose that child. So that child was made sick and he lost that child. Bathsheba conceived again the second time uh, after he had taken her to wife, after he had you know, I had Uriah the Hittite killed, and that was Solomon, right? Now Solomon, what is he famous for in the Bible? Well, he was the wisest and richest man that ever lived. He was the one that built and dedicated the temple that David had envisioned for the Lord. So if you remember, David had a heart to build a house of cedar, for the Lord. It wasn't God's idea. It was David's idea. He said, hey, I dwell in a house of cedars, you know, and God d dwells in curtains, and he wanted to build a house uh, for God. And God actually told him, you know, I've never, you know, told you to build a house. In fact, I'm going to build you a house. Um, and he said that, you know, his son's going to build a house, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. But David thought that he was referring to Solomon. So David, you know, got all the plans together, got all the equipment and all the materials, and then Solomon built that house. Um, but I, I don't believe that God had in, ever intended David to build that house and actually said that God was going to build him a house. <clears throat> David took that as Solomon building the house, and then he went again ahead and built it. Now, God still blessed the house and used it as a picture of things in heaven. But uh, ultimately, I don't think God intended for that house to be built. <clears throat> so, Solomon built that house and it's referred to as Solomon's temple in the Bible as well. Now Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs. So you might think, well, didn't Solomon write all the Proverbs? No, he didn't write all the Proverbs. He wrote most of the Proverbs because some of the Proverbs were written by other people. One of the Proverbs starts off that, you know, uh, Hezekiah had actually copied some Proverbs and that was one of the Proverbs. So Solomon didn't write all of them, just like David didn't write all of the Psalms. David wrote most of the Psalms, but he didn't write all of the Psalms. So, same with Solomon. Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs, 
he wrote then the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. Now, it's not, it's not clear that they're written by Solomon, but many people attribute it, these books, their authorship, to Solomon. So Song of Solomon, talking about him and his relationship with his wife and, you know, uh, some, I don't know who uh, the Shunammite woman is, but um, the other thing is, uh, he wrote Ecclesiastes. So you can see Proverbs was his wisdom. Song of Solomon is talking about relationships and it was a picture of, you know, uh, often a picture of how Jesus Christ relates to the church. And then we have Ecclesiastes, where Ecclesiastes is uh, often believed that uh, it was written by Solomon near the end of his life. And it's actually him reflecting on the experiences in his life. So you need to be very careful when you're reading through Ecclesiastes, even when we read through in Ecclesiastes 2, where he says he hated all his labor and it just you know, all he found was to, you know, just to enjoy things in life. And you don't want to read those passages and think, oh, well, the purpose of my life is just to take it easy and retire and just, you know, enjoy the fruit of my labor. Um, because he's reflecting on these things. If you read through, you need to understand Ecclesiastes in light of all of Ecclesiastes, where he's reflecting on, hey, if there's no other greater purpose to life, if there's nothing else to do, then you may as well just enjoy life, enjoy the things you have. And that's, that's why he comes to those conclusions. But as he talks through the things in his life, eventually he gets to the conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, where, you know, this is the, one of the main points of this sermon this morning. So, King Saul. Ecclesiastes is where we read of his wisdom, his insight, his experiences. Now, when you're reading through uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, it's really funny in the King James Bible that it will say 1 Samuel, commonly known as the first book of the Kings. And then you get to the first book of the Kings and it says, first book of the Kings, commonly known as the third book of the Kings. But you think, how can it be commonly known as the third book of the Kings when it's called 1 Kings? Well, it's because, you know, I guess they would commonly call it the third book of the Kings, but I suppose when they you know, translated the Bible, they decided to call them 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, rather than 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th Kings. But it's really, I think it's uh, quite simple to remember. I always remember, you know, 1st Samuel is talking about Samuel and King Saul. 2nd Samuel is talking about King David. And then 1st Kings with the parallel account in 2nd Chronicles is the beginning of King Solomon's reign. So um, that, that's an easy timeline when you read through. So if you want to go back and read more of about King Solomon, you can. But I want to just touch on a few of the more um, in stories that I find interesting. And uh, w one of them, two of them we find in 1 Kings 3. So we're going to look at a few interesting stories from King Solomon. And uh, then we'll get some lessons from his life at the end. So number two is some interesting stories. Let's uh, read from 1 Kings 3. This is uh, the first one I just want to mention this morning. Hey, Ari, Ari, Ari. Thank you. 1 Kings 3, 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on, sit on his throne, as it is this day. So this story here, as we start in 1 Kings 3, is the Lord comes to King Solomon in a dream, and basically asks Solomon, whatever you ask, I'm going to give it to you. He says, ask what I shall give to thee. I mean, that's a pretty heavy question if God comes to you and says, you know, whatever you want, I'm going to give it to you. I mean, what, what do you say? What, how, what, do you, what, do you, what do you ask for in that instance? It's almost like getting a genie in a bottle and having only one wish, right? Solomon said, you know, thou hast shown unto thyself. So now he talks about the, the mercy and the, the grace that he's shown to his father David. Verse 7, and now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Right? So he's, 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 he's saying to God, like, you know, you've made me now king in my father's stead. And I'm like a little child. I don't even, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit unsure about what to do. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad, for who is able to judge this, thy so great 
of people. So we see here at the beginning of Solomon's reign, we see this, the humility of Solomon, that he's, he's given this, this, um, this chance from God to ask for anything. And he shows his humility by saying, compared to his father, he's nobody, he's like a little child. And what does he ask for? He asks for wisdom. Right? So this is one of the famous things that Solomon is famous for because this is how he became the wisest and richest man that ever lived because when God came to him and asked him, what do you want? He, he didn't ask for riches and all these things. He asked for wisdom to be able to judge the people of God. And the speech pleased the Lord, verse 10, that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself a long life, neither has asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. So here's God's response. He says, hey, because you haven't asked for wisdom, you haven't asked for just a really long life to live, you know, people want to live forever, you know, people want riches, people want revenge. He says here, ask for the life of thine enemies. But instead of those things, you have asked are for understanding, right? Wisdom, to discern judgment, right? That's what it requires in order to decide what's the right thing to do, to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. So he says, hey, God says, I'm going to give you wisdom, and there's not going to be somebody that's wiser than you before you or after you. This is why we can say with certainty that Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. You know, obviously apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked. So not only did he give him that wisdom, he also gave him the things that he didn't ask for, both riches and honor so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So you can see that last one was kind of conditional on him you know, walking in the ways of his, of his father David. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings, and offered peace offerings and made a feast to all his servants. You know, there have been many jokes sort of patterned after this story of Solomon. I remember uh, there was one in, uh, you know, if you guys used to watch the, the, the series Seinfeld, where Kramer and Elaine were trying to split a bike. Um, oh, no, no, it's actually, that's, that's the next story I'm going to give. The, the joke I was going to tell you with this one, I remember a joke that was patterned after this story. And the joke goes like this, that a man finds um, a lamp uh, and, and he rubs the lamp and whew, a genie comes out of the lamp. And the genie says to him, I'm going to grant you one of two things. I'm gonna, you can either choose that you can have all the money in the world, and all the money in the world, or second choice is, you can have all the wisdom in the world. The man goes, he's thinking, he's thinking hard. And he goes, thinks, all right, I'll take all the wisdom in the world. I think that would be the wiser choice. And then Jeannie says, you know, your wish is my command. Gives him all the wisdom in the world. <sighs> Comes over him, all the wisdom. He goes, as soon as he gets the wisdom, he goes deep into thought. He goes, oh. You know what he says? I should have taken the money. <laughs> now, obviously, you know, that joke is, is a joke and it's not, uh, you know, I suppose if somebody had all the wisdom in the world, they wouldn't do that. But I just remember this, you know, there's a lot of jokes that come from this kind of story where somebody is able to ask for whatever they want. But the truth is, you know, a fool with money likely won't have it for long. Right? Even though we laugh at such uh, jokes like that, and that's not really the truth, that, um, you know, that if somebody was wise, <laughs> that they would want all the money in the world. But I think what we see here in King Solomon's life, we see such an amazing story of um, you know, humility and a great example for all of us, um, where this person has leadership and he's asking for wisdom. 
he's asking that you know he needs wisdom in order to judge what is right and wrong, what is wrong. But you know, every one of us has some level of leadership in our life, you know, because all of we all have people looking to us as an example. So I think we all should have that same desire to want that wisdom to live a life that is pleasing and wise. So we make the right choices in our life because ultimately the choices that we make in our life, we are not an island. You know, the choices that we make in our life do affect others and we need to make wise choices. But also I think a good reminder from this story of King Solomon is that wealth and revenge we see here isn't the be all and end all. Although some people, they live like it is. I mean, how many people live as though, you know, money is all there is and you know that joke you know that i even told that that shows this sort of culture you know when people think money is all there is that if they had the wisdom they would have taken all the money so this is a good reminder that you know solomon has the right frame of mind that money is not the be all and end all but at the same token think about the other things god said to him he said you didn't ask for riches you didn't ask for power, so power is not the be all and end all. You know, this honor that people would reverence him and respect him. People sometimes want just that recognition. You know, people that are rich, like they have all the money, but, you know, it reminds me of like Haman. You know, he has all the money, he's second in charge, but it's like it's not enough for him. He just, he wants, you know, Mordecai to bow to him. He's like, does all this avail me nothing when I see Mordecai standing in the gate? You know, so it's riches, honor, you know, like sort of like that authority and that power and that respect from people. Look at this. He says, but you didn't also ask, um, where is it? He says, neither did thy, he ask, you see here, riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies. And you know what that made me think about when, when he, he says, hey, God says to him, hey, you didn't ask for riches, you didn't ask for this power, this honor, but you also didn't ask for revenge. And what does that make me think of? You know, when, when we are sometimes wronged in our life, that can be an all-consuming thing too where people will just destroy everything, you know, destroy their life, just to seek revenge, and it just becomes all that they want to do. And I think the Bible's reminding us here is, you know, wealth and revenge isn't, shouldn't be the be-all and end-all, even though some people um, make it on um, the purpose of their life. And, you know, they will, people will, you know, destroy relationships, they will burn bridges because of money, um, and they will stop at nothing sometimes to get even. So I think those are some good lessons we can take from this story here of Solomon. But let's continue in verse 16. And this was the other one I was getting it mixed up with. Um, 1 Kings 3. So now Solomon displays his wisdom to his kingdom. Then came there two women that were harlots unto the king and stood before him. And the one woman said, O oh my Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house, and I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that this woman was delivered also, and we were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night, because she overlaid it. And she arose at midnight, and took my son from beside me, while thine handmaid slept, and laid it in her bosom, and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the other woman said, Nay, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this said, No, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king. So you can see here, now the king is sitting to judge. You know, it's kind of like, you imagine like a court, right? But the king is sitting and judging between these two people to decide who's right and who's wrong, and who's uh, lying and who isn't. <coughs> And what's the, what's the situation? So two prostitutes come to him. They both had a child. They both sleep with their child. You know, so this co-sleeping. Now one prostitute accidentally kills her child. And now there's one child left. And then the other is saying, hey, well, in the night, the other prostitute came and took my child. And now she's pretending like it's her child, but it's my child. And Solomon has to decide, well, whose child really is this? Verse 23. Look at how he deals with this situation. Then said the king, the one saith, This is my son that liveth, <coughs> and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. So they're both claiming ownership of this child. Who's telling the truth? Verse 24, And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, 
divide the living child in two and get half to the one and half to the other. All right, so a lot of us know this story already, but I'm sure at the time this was quite shocking that you, you would think that the king's so ruthless that he's just going to literally divide. If you can't decide who this child is, I'm just going to cut it in half and give you both half of it. Then spake the woman, whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, Oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. So we see two very different responses from these two prostitutes. One says, is so, you know, doesn't want the child to die knowing that it's her child. And so, you know, I'd rather give the child away than the child be killed. And the other prostitute just says, Well, why don't you just cut it in half? And then none of us can have, neither of us can have the child. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child. Which one? The one that didn't want the child killed. And in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment with the king, which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in it to do judgment. All right, so here is where Solomon displays his wisdom by knowing that the true mother would, would not you know, let her child die. And therefore, when he said, this is what's going to happen, he wanted to see the response of people. And, uh, you know, this is a very wise thing that Solomon does, that sometimes you don't just, um, you know, tell people what to do. You need, sometimes you need to ask the right questions or prompt a response from people and then judge based on the response of people uh, what could be um, true and what could not be true. So this situation demonstrated Solomon's wisdom that was given by God. Um, also shows us how, how wicked, you know, uh, people can be, that they're, you know, happy to kill children um, just to you know, I guess, you know, try and cover up the things that they've done and whatnot. You can see here that this woman, you know, she doesn't want to admit that she's killed her own child and that she's stolen. She's even willing to kill another child in order to cover it up. We see that a judge requires wisdom to discern the just from the unjust. You know, I always think of this story, you know, when I'm trying to discern between my children, you know, where, you know, sometimes my children will be, you know, accusing each other of something or we have to try and figure out who's really telling the truth between my kids and I remember joking with Elizabeth and saying man I just wish I had the wisdom of Solomon just to like you know create a situation where it would just reveal to me like who's telling the truth or not and uh, there was a situation <laughs> recently where I tried to create this situation between Simon and Timothy and then they went away and I was like oh I just and I said to Elizabeth I just I wish that I could create this situation where it just re would reveal to us who's telling the truth. And lo and behold, like, <laughs> the reaction did actually reveal um, who actually was telling the truth in that situation. And then we were, we were laughing about it. So, you know, hey, I'm hoping that I've got a little bit of this wisdom that Solomon has gotten. But like I was saying at the beginning in my first point, you know, this situation has created a lot of jokes in society. I, I, it always reminds me of that one in Seinfeld where Elaine and Kramer are arguing over who has who has ownership of this bicycle and they go to they go to Newman who's sort of sitting as King Solomon and he says this same joke where he's like well we'll divide the bike in half and then nobody you know we'll give you each half of the bike and then um, I think Kramer's the one that says you know oh, don't don't cut it in half you know let her have the bike don't cut this beautiful and Elaine's like ah who cares about the bike it's cut it in half and neither of us can have it so we can see how stories like this you know, have permeated our society, right? Where, you know, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisest, richest man that ever lived, has affected culture in a way where people are, you know, sort of, you know, copying stories from, from the Bible, Bible. Now, let's go on to the third story. I just want to show you one last story before we go on to another point. Ecclesiastes 2 is where we started the sermon, where Solomon is, um, you know, talking through all these experiences that he had. Ecclesiastes 2, I said in mine heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of, life, of their life. I made me great works, I builded me houses. 
I planted me vineyards. Now, as I want you to think about as we read through this passage, because Solomon is very famous for indulging in all the pleasures of this life, indulging in many of the things that I guess those of us who would live in a prosperous country that we would we were slaving in our life for. You know, a lot of people, you know, they, they live their life for these things, for these pleasures of this life. And here is a man, the wisest man that ever lived, has actually done all these things, right? He says, he's planted vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith, the wood that bringeth forth the trees. So he's done all sorts of, you know, I guess businesses and, you know, all these sort of horticultural stuff. I got me servants and maid servants that had servants born in my house. You can see he's very rich where, you know, he, he, he has, has people waiting on him hand and foot. He doesn't have to do all these things. You know, how, how often do people say, oh, you know, one day I won't have to do all these things. I mean, that's where Solomon was at. You know, if he wanted some food made for him, he wanted somebody to do something for him, it was done. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold. So here's all the money he could want. And the peculiar treasures of kings. So these are like collectibles, right? Antiques, whatever. Peculiar treasures. Some people, you know, they collect watches and they collect all these things. They spend all this money They're trying to get that next coin or that next watch or that next, you know, maybe that next basketball card or whatever people collect these days. That next NFT, right? That's the new one, right? Everyone's after NFTs. I gathered me also silver and gold. I'll explain it to you later, Simon, what NFTs are. <laughs> and the peculiar treasures of kings and of the provinces. I got me men things. So it's like entertainment. All the you know, people seeking the next new thing to experience. I got me men singers and women singers and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. So even though he did all these things, you know, normally when people just indulge in these pleasures and they're not doing anything and they're not, you know, they're just, you know, like, you know, the retired lifestyle, right? Just having nothing to do anything, they get dumber, right? Because they're not really like exercising their brain and they're not doing these things. But you see here, even though Solomon was living this sort of lifestyle, he says here, but he didn't lose the wisdom. So he could actually reflect on these things. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought. And this is where I really want you guys to focus on. You know, we talk, you know, Solomon's talking through all the things all the pleasures of this life, all the experiences. He says he didn't keep anything from it. Anything he wanted, he got. But look at what his conclusion here is in Ecclesiastes. Says, then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, look at this. All was vanity and vexation of spirit. What does it mean to be vain? It means there's no profit. It was, like, well, it was all useless to him. All was vanity. It was vain. It was purposelessness. And vexation of spirit troubled him, right? And there was no prophet under the sun. So you see, Solomon, in his old wisdom, he kept nothing from him. He indulged in everything that could be indulged in in, um, in a man's life. And I mean, he took it to the extreme. I mean, we read here in 1 Kings 11, but King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites. Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in unto them, neither shall ye come in unto, unto you, for surely they will turn your, away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And look at this, and he had 700 wives, and th wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart. So even, you know, people think that, you know, they can be satisfied with riches, they will be satisfied with, you know, the sexual pleasures in this life. And here's a man, you know, that, that would do what most people could, wouldn't even be possible to accomplish in their lifetime. And here's where 
somebody has done that. And what was his conclusion? It was all vanity. It was all vexation of spirit. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth and it talks about here, I won't read the rest for sake of time, but it talks about how these women turned away Solomon's heart. Now, these things were clearly forbidden, right, in the nation for the king to do. In Deuteronomy 17. Look what it says here. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Look at this. Here's the instructions to the king. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. So he's not going to, he's saying, hey, you need to stay in the land, but he's also saying, hey, that the king shouldn't multiply horses. What do the horses represent? This is not just talking about multiplying in riches. What I think this represents is that the king is not meant to amass this huge army for himself. And I think the idea there is because, you know, the king is ruling. You don't want the king to become like this tyrannical, you know, author authoritarian government. Uh, where he's just got this huge army and he just rules by force, right? So the idea was that the king would rule, but then he would rule in a way that would earn favor with the people. Um, and he wasn't meant to have his, this huge army just serving the king, um, because ultimately the nation was meant to be their own army. So I think that's what that's referring to there. To the end that he, uh, to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, he shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. So you can see here that even the warnings to the king in Deuteronomy, even before King Solomon became king, there was these warnings in Deuteronomy that the king should not do. And yet Solomon did these as a kind of, I suppose, an experiment, you know, as, you, as we read in, in Ecclesiastes 2, an unwise experiment, which is a bit of an oxymoron, that the wisest man that ever lived would do these things. But it just goes to show that just because you have wisdom, that doesn't mean you always do what is right. Okay, so what some things we can learn from this passage in Ecclesiastes 2 from Solomon's experience? Well, many men, I think, would fantasize about unlimited money, unlimited women. Right? But the story of Solomon warns us about the vanity of this fantasy. And I think, you know, a lot of men, I'm sure, read the story of Solomon and think, oh yeah, well, if I was that in this situation, I would handle it. I wouldn't go down the route of Solomon. But, you know, who are you kidding? You know, it's almost as if God knew that people would have this thought in their heart. And that's why he made the wisest man that ever lived do it. Right? Because... You know, to think that you are wiser than the wisest man that ever lived uh, would be folly, right? So the other thing I want you to think about as well is, you know, the joy that God intends for us, you know, as his creatures to experience. I think these can, the, I believe that these things, this joy can only be experienced if we live a life of godliness and charity. And I think this is, this is one thing we should learn from Solomon, that people think that they can obtain joy, they can obtain these pleasures through these worldly means, right? Whether it's money, whether it's sex, or whether it's power, or, you know, whether it's pleasures of this life, just experiences. But Solomon's story is teaching us that, you know, he went and he sought these things and realized it was vanity and vexation of spirit. Because I don't, I don't believe, you know, and I think this is what God is teaching us, that we can attain that level of joy that God intends for us through these means. And, it, and we should reflect on that. Now let's just read through, read a verse from Ecclesiastes 12. I won't read the whole chapter for sake of time. But what we want to see here is his conclusion. Solomon's conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12. He says here in verse 1, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. 
while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened or the clouds return after the rain. We might read this chapter actually because I, I want it in context where Solomon refers to uh, as we age and one day our life will be over. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and the strong men shall bow themselves and the grinders cease because they are few and those that look out of the windows be darkened and the doors shall be shut in the streets where the sound of the grinding is low and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also when they shall be afraid of that which is high and fear shall be in the way and the almond tree shall flourish and the grasshopper shall be a burden and desire shall fail because man goeth to his long home and the mourners go about the streets. Moreover, the silver cord be loosed or the golden bowl be broken or the pitcher be broken at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern. So there's a lot of a analogy here of physical things representing our physical body breaking down and us getting old. Um, and this is why he's saying at the beginning, remember now thy creator when we're young. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed, and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished of, many, of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So I think it's interesting here that in Solomon's conclusion in Ecclesiastes 12, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. He doesn't say this is the conclusion of the whole matter. And I sometimes think it's, well, because I wonder whether it's because whether people will hear the conclusion of the matter. You know, even though people know that it's vanity and vexation of spirit, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. But will you hear the conclusion of the whole matter? Or will you read through all these experiences that Solomon had and think, well, I'm going to seek these things anyway. You know, so here, the conclusion of the whole matter. The chapter starts off as, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Because what do people normally do? You know, it's, 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 it, we're meant to serve God now. We're not meant to serve God, you know, when the timing is right by us. You know, it's not once you finish school. It's not once you graduate from uni, right? It's not once you get a job. You know, people, these are, these are stages of people's life that I've heard throughout my life. Oh, yeah, when they're going to serve God. Oh, it's when I finish school. It's when I finish uni. It's when I get a job. Then it's, hey, it's, it's when I, once I get my business up and running. I've heard that one plenty of times. It's, uh, hey, once I get married. Hey, once you're done raising your family. Hey, and then it's once I'm retired. There's always an excuse not to serve God. You know, one day it's going to be, I'm too young. Then another day it's going to be, I'm too busy. Then another day it's going to be, I'm too old. And what's the last one? Then it's, dead. I'm too dead, right? You're too dead to serve God. It's because it's too late. So instead of finding excuses not to serve God, you know, why don't you find some reasons instead to, to serve God? You know, do it for your family, do it for your children, do it, you know, there's plenty of reasons to serve God that you can get passionate about. So let's make sure we give God the best, not what's left. Here as well, we see in Ecclesiastes 12, we don't retire from God's work. You know, we see here Solomon is in his old age, but he's still teaching people. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yeah, he gave good heed, right? Some people think they retire. They retire from God's work. You don't retire from God's work. When you're older, you're always doing God's work like Solomon. You give good heed. You want to still teach the people 
knowledge. So even though Solomon wasn't perfect, he made huge mistakes. I mean, we read through some of the mistakes he did. I mean, 700 wives and 300 concubines that turned away his heart from the Lord. He made huge mistakes, but yet he didn't quit on God's work. Right? So the commandment of God, it's your duty and where you will find real fulfillment. Right? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Verse 13. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. I hope that was encouragement for you guys this morning. Learn a bit about King Solomon. Let's be reminded, hey, not to live for the pleasures of this life. Let's learn from the wisest man that ever lived and let's hear this conclusion to, keep, to fear God and keep his commandments. Let's make that the purpose of our life. All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to have this purpose in our life. Help us not to uh, go astray and you know, chase the pleasures and the comforts of this life. Let's learn from the wisest and richest man that ever lived, Lord, that we ought to fear you and keep your commandments. And our Lord, help us. We need your grace to do this. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.